and specialized in the art and architecture of the Maghrib, that I've been forced by these various uh, writing projects to look at much larger er questions and areas. And uh, include, you know, so Egypt, Syria and Palestine, um, Central Asia, Iran, and India. We've traveled to India, we've traveled to China, um, and seen mosques in China. Um, you will see a picture of one in a little while. Uh, but it, it, what it has done is it's given me a larger perspective on the arts of the Maghreb. And that w one of the points I want uh, to in, uh, impress you with is that it's important to look at what you have around you and then see, see it in the larger picture, not just in your uh, own picture. Uh, so for the master class, I had prepared these five talks. We're going to do, certainly do the three of them uh, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. And we'll have to see about the fourth one that we could do. But um, we can always work it out. Um, the first one is this question, what is Islamic art? And what I, I um, suggested, and I hope you've all had a chance to see this article that Sheila and I wrote about um, uh, the mirage of Islamic art. Um, it was based, that was based on a article we were asked, or it was an article that we were asked to write in the wake of 9-11, when the um, uh, journal that specializes uh, in art history for uh, the US and uh, awful lot of European countries too, um, commissioned it to, they said, we have to know what, what is Islamic art, what's it about, and what can you tell us? So it was designed for a general audience that didn't know anything about the subject. The second one I'd like to talk, and that would be tomorrow, will be about architecture in the Maghrib, and specifically about buildings in Morocco and in, um, in Algeria um, from the period of the Almoravids and the Almohads specific, specifically. And I've given you a chapter from this latest book of mine um, on that period. Uh, the third talk is, uh, uh, will be about uh, the minbar from the Qutbiyya Mosque, which is um, arguably one of the greatest works of Islamic art, whatever that is, um, for I in Morocco. Um, and it's in Marrakesh, in the Badia Palace Museum. And I had the privilege of working on it with a project um, sponsored by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Moroccan government to restore this, uh, this fabulous piece of woodwork from the medieval period. And the final one, or in the, th the fourth talk, which I had proposed and we may or may not get to, would be about writing in, uh, is in Arabic script on buildings, particularly um, with a focus on the traditions here in Morocco. And the final talk had been about um, geometric design and the uh, um, development of, of tile decoration. All of these were sort of based on uh, work that I had done. Um, these last two are, were very current. I, uh, Sheila and I have been involved in a project to create to, uh, a handbook of epigraphy that is writing on uh, objects. Um, for, it, sponsored by the University of Hamburg. And so I was asked to write about Maghrebi epigraphy in, our, in Arabic script. And so um, that, that was a recent work. And then this tile mosaic, I have always been interested in what is the relationship between tile mosaic here in Morocco. And you see it everywhere in every building on the airplanes. I was well, on our airplane. They had, oops, they had these little pieces, uh, sort of designs made out of the little pieces of tile decorating the interior of the plane. Um, and how it came to be so popular here in Morocco. So that is, um, uh, that is what the, the, the plan was. And we'll see how far we get with it. So, what is Islamic art and architecture? What is it? What is it? Well, everybody will agree that the interior of, or a mosque and a manuscript of the Quran are works of, a beautifully calligraphed manuscript of the Quran are works of Islamic art. There's no question about that. that but 
It's very, but the way it's used is very different from the way we use other, we don't call like Michelangelo or Van Gogh, we don't call them Christian artists. We, we call, but somehow or other, and whether it, this may be because we're, um, we're Americans, I'm an American looking at this, but I don't call it Moroccan art. I don't, I don't call these two examples of Moroccan art, although they are, but we call it um, Islamic art. What about this? It's a rug, a prayer rug, made clearly for someone to use. This is a, a Turkish example, uh, for, for someone to use daily for prayer. That is clearly a work of Islamic art for an Islamic purpose, a purpose related to the faith of Islam. But what about that? A Berber carpet. Is that, if, is, is it Islamic because the person who made it is, is a Muslim? Um, it's art, certainly, but is, what is it? And so it raises some questions. Or here, a manuscript. This happens to be a Turkish example of the, the Dalel el Khirat, which is one of the great, um, very popular illustra books, illustrated religious books. And here we have a representation of the, Har the, the Haramain, the Mecca and Medina. Um, so that, that clearly would function as Islamic art. But what about this? This is a page from perhaps the greatest manuscript of the Shahnameh, the Persian national epic, produ produced about the same time as the, uh, uh, the Turkish, manu the Turkish uh, religious manuscript, but it's totally secular, and it deals with, um, uh, with the time. But this, was, this image is actually showing the creation of the world according to Persian mythology. Um, if we have a piece, uh, this is a, uh, a detail from a door to a madrasa in Fez, and it has, uh, in, it's, it's made of uh, metal and uh, uh, brass and um, has uh, engraving and Arabic inscriptions on it, so that clearly functions as a piece of Islamic art. But what about this? It's a bell that was captured at, in some raid in the medieval period and brought to Fez and then embellished with, um, uh, with candle holders to make it into a chandelier. So is that Islamic art? Is it hybrid art? Is it, what is it? And then finally here, we can have something like this, which is a, a canteen to hold water a very large vessel, it's about this big round, and it has Arabic inscriptions, and I hope it's clear enough, I, it may have gotten a little dull, but it has Arabic inscriptions around the central medallion and around the edge, but then in the picture is a picture of the Virgin Mary enthroned with holding the Christ child. So is that Islamic art? So, everyone agrees the Alhambra is a work of Islamic art. And everyone agrees the Taj Mahal in India is a work of Islamic art. So, can you tell me anything, about, can you think of anything that makes them the same? Why we should consider them in the same universe? So what I hope to do today is to explore some of the possibilities, some of the, um, uh, some of the questions that we raise, and whether it makes any sense to, to talk about this as Islamic art. So certainly there are some things, some features that we can see in the art and architecture of Islam that are common to different regions. So we can say that both areas have mosques. Everybody, everywhere you go in the Muslim world, there are mosques. So we have the Karawin Mosque in Fez on the left and the uh, uh, Ottoman Mosque of Selim, the Selimiyah 
in Edirne, in Turkey, on the right. Do they look the same? Do we call this, can we call this a set? It, it, it's, it seems ridiculous to do that. Um, if you compare the plans of the mosque, what they're, what they're like inside, or from on a ground plan, and I assume, can all of you, do you, all of you understand how ground plans work? I, yeah, okay. Only because I remember doing this to students and it looked like they, they thought I was showing them Chinese ones. Um, anyway, they're entirely different. The one on the left is what we call a hypostyle or many-columned mosque, where, where there's none, n no, that where all the spaces are e equally, the ceiling is pretty low, whereas the one on the right has a big domed space, I think you can see, in the middle, and a big court, a very large courtyard, an outer courtyard, and also includes a market. One of them, as you can see, the one in the Karawin Mosque, the plan of the Karawin Mosque in Fez, is integrated into the urban environment, entirely in, in, in encompassed by the buildings around it. As any of you, or all of you who've been to Fez know, you don't really see it from the outside. I'm just gonna go back one. Whereas, uh, and so you can see the difference that one of them has an exterior uh, and is meant to be seen from the outside, and one of them is entirely um, hidden in a way, and only can be discovered once you enter the building. When you enter the building, you, you find them entirely different, yet they're both mosques. One of them has enormously high domed ceiling. Another one has long column uh, rows of piers um, and spaces so that you never once perceive the entire space. They both have courtyards, but look at the difference between the courtyards. This is one um, a clear, once again, the Karawin Mosque in, in Fez on the left, and a, the mosque of, um, uh, in, in um, Isfahan from the early 17th century, um, which had, they both have water features, but one could hardly describe them as the same. And I might point out that one of them has a minaret attached, and we'll talk about minarets next, but a, a tall tower supposedly for the call to prayer, and the other one you see on the right the one that has the little house, the little tiny, that, is, that was where the call to prayer was actually given, although there were minarets on the mosque. So they're, they're, they're both mosques, they both have water features, but they're very, very different. And minarets. So here we have minarets from, um, uh, from uh, Marrakesh. This is the mosque of the Kasbah. It, in, in Marrakesh, and then one from Iran on the, on the um, right. And are they the same? Are they equivalent? They're, one is round, one is square. They both have writing, or once had writing on them. The one, at, the one in Marrakesh used to have writing, a little bit. Of, but how are, they, how are they comparable? Does it make any sense to say just because it's a tall tower, they're all the same? Mihabs, another part of a um, mosque that might be, that you know, is, is common to virtually all mosques everywhere. Um, but you can, and they all have arches, but look at the shape of the arch. You can't really say that these arches are similar, except that they're arches, but one of them is sort of a horseshoe arch, and one of them is a cusped arch that has little squiggles on it. So it, one of them is from, uh, tin, uh, from Tinmal, the one on the left is from Tinmal in Morocco, and the one of them on the right is from India. So it's very, very difficult to say. When we go inside the mosque, we can see that, again, that all congregational mosques have minbars where the sermon is given and you have the famous Kutubiya minbar on the left and then the um, original minbar that Saladin um, uh, uh, made for, or Nuruddin made for um, the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem um, on the right. Uh, that 
there's a medieval, uh, we'll, we'll get to this on Wednesday, but the, there's a medieval historian who sort of like says, you know, the, um, the Kutubiya Minbar, or the, in the Kutubiya Mosque is really great. And the people in Jerusalem or in Syria think they know how to make woodwork, but they don't really know how to do it as well as we do. So he was able to, to compare them, but he, he thought Morocco was better. Madrasas, that um, those uh, schools, the theological colleges are found throughout the Muslim world. Um, and they were uh, introduced into um, to Morocco in the Marinid period. And when several um, extraordinary examples survive, uh, particularly in Fez, um, but are they, they have courtyards and they have student rooms and teaching rooms, but are they really very similar? The one on the right is for the Sultan Hassan Madrasa. We can compare them as institutions, but architecturally, can we compare them? Uh, do they, are they similar? One of them has great big arches and um, the materials are different, the decoration is different, but the functions are the same. And if we look at the plans, you can see that they all have courtyards. They all have spaces for congregational gathering. They have spaces for prayer, for a little mosque within them. And then they have rooms, student rooms, dormitories, in effect, for students. So those, those are some of the kinds of things that we have to deal with. When we deal with architectural features um, and techniques of decoration and uh, structure. We have various other features like um, uh, mukarnas, which are these stalactite-like um, uh, uh, forms, which you see, I'm sure you see everywhere here in, in Morocco, that they, they, they're a ubiquitous form of decoration. Um, the one on the left is from the Alhambra in uh, a, a mukarnas dome in, um, in, in, um, at, in Spain, and the one on the right is from Natanz in Iran. One covers a palace room, one color covers a to the tomb of a um, Sufi saint. So, the, you know, is there any theolo question, is there any theological meaning to them? Are they just decorative? Are they, is there a purpose to them? Uh, tile decoration, which I'd hope to talk about, that tile mosaic is something that you see all over the, um, the Muslim world. Um, you even find, I had originally thought that it wasn't found in India, but it does seem to be found in India, though it hasn't survived there terribly well. But it, from Spain to India is pretty amazing, and yet it's very, very different from one place to the other. And that in Morocco, we find it's almost entirely geometric, um, uh, exclusively geometric. Whereas in other parts of the world, particularly in Iran, um, it is more what we call arabesque decoration. That is, where it is plants and flowers that grow according to the laws of geometry rather than according to the, the way nature intended. Another common feature one finds um, across the, um, across the uh, Muslim world is um, our palaces, of course, where rulers, the rulers lived. And I should say that much of what we're studying, I mean, is, is which much of what I'm studying is the work of rulers. That this is not, pop, in many cases, this is not popular art. This was made by and for the people who had the money to spend on making art, and that was rulers. And it has survived because it's often the, the, the quality, um, the care has been, uh, is greater than, um, uh, than other things. Uh, and so we look at palaces, but palaces in a way have not survived. Most of the, that I'm showing you two examples. One of them is from, uh, is from Marrakesh, uh, the Badia Palace, 
where all that survives is the courtyard, and where in Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, where um, it has survived. But why wouldn't palaces survive? Why would palaces, mosques are, mosques have survived from the earliest years of Islam. Why don't palaces survive? You have an idea, do you have any ideas? I mean, are we allowed to, are we, am I allowed to ask you questions? Uh, yeah. Right. And what happens, what happens, and what happens when a regime changes? Right. You just want, anybody else? Yeah. Maybe because of the war. Uh, yeah. Well, cause, cause yes. of war. Mosques are not attacked in wars. Right. I mean, and it's, it's probably, I mean, I don't know, did you have a seminar on, on law? I mean, but it probably is not a very good thing to destroy a mosque. Right. It's, uh, that's, that's probably a bad thing to do. But I don't think there are any laws against dis uh, destroying palaces. Yes. Uh, also, I think uh, mosques do not idolize a person, whereas a palace does. Right. So I think that is, that is the idea behind maybe not the distractions of mosques, because it represents uh, the religion and also God. Right. So the only palaces that survive, or survive are only the ones that continuous, are continued to be inhabited by their rulers or the dynasty that built them, with a few exceptions. So the reason Topkapi Palace survived was that the Ottoman Empire survived until the 20th century, and the sultans lived there. Uh, and then it, when the Turkish Republic was declared, the, um, they, they decided not to destroy it, but to turn it in, into a museum. Uh, the Alhambra in Spain, why did that survive? Because in 1492, the Muslims were kicked out of Spain, but why did their palace in Granada survive? Any ideas? Someone's going there. Someone who's going to who's going to the who's going to the yeah. So why did it why why did it survive? Why did it survive? Absolutely. Oh yeah. That's exactly okay. so this is what she's got to Okay. Look at. Well, it survived. It survived because when the forces uh, Isabel uh, Ferdinand and Isabella's armies <laughs> conquered it in 1492. It was one, a symbol of the, the, uh, the Nasrid regime that had ruled in southern Spain and had been their great enemies. And they also said it was gorgeous and exotic and, or, quote, oriental or something. And so they, say, they saved it as a, um, as a place where they could sort of like show off that they had conquered these, these people. However, what was really interesting is that the way that people used, the way that European Christians lived was very different from these European Muslims in Granada. And that European Muslims did not sit in chairs and they did not eat at, at high tables, but they sat on carpets and leaned on cushions and so their rooms were designed to be used at a different level, whereas Europeans had furniture, heavy wooden furniture, that they wanted to put in their rooms. And they had dining tables and beds, and, then, and once this heavy furniture was in place, a room had to, be, um, had to be specified for a particular purpose. It was no longer a room where you could put a carpet down or you could sp spread a cloth and eat or bring in a light table and eat some food or something like that. You, you had to change. And so the way, um, you, th what you found was that the Christians then started building additional rooms that would f meet the needs, their needs, their of living in these spaces. But the Alhambra was preserved because it was an exotic place taken over by others. Another common feature, one could say, would be in uh, Islamic um, uh, societies, uh, the love of gardens. And one only has to look around here at the, our surroundings to see how 
wonder, you know, what, how different this is from, let's say, the Medina of, of Rabat, where we walked yesterday. Um, and the gardens and water features, there is an ongoing discussion about what does, what does a garden mean in Islamic art? What is it, what a, what a garden, you're, you all know, what do what gardens mean? What do they mean? Any ideas? I think it's somehow related to uh, heaven. When the Quran describes heaven, it's mostly Yes, there's a long tradition, and in fact, one of our first books was sort of about images of paradise in Islamic art, and where and Kevin Reinhardt, who was one, of, was also one of the authors of that, uh, sort of produced uh, all of the Quranic references to paradise, and yes, the gardens with rivers flowing, and so everyone always assumes that gardens have a paradisical effect, and they're very pleasant, and everybody knows. I mean. You, you know that when you walk by a pool of water, the air gets cooler, it's nicer. Uh, flowers, people love flowers. We see a lot of uh, vegetal imagery in Islamic art. But there's also very practical purposes. Um, gardens are a way of controlling the landscape, of, har of, of harnessing your, um, the resources in the best way, so that if you, um, if you have an enclosed space, then you only water, you only provide water to that area within the enclosed space, and you're not watering the entire uh, uh, environment. You're also producing useful crops. Sometimes there are flowers, which are useful in a way, but also fruits and vegetables and herbs and stuff, so that there are, there are many practical reasons. And there's no reason that one has to think of these things as exclusive, that as one or the other, that it can be paradisical and it can also be practical at the same time. Um, one of the strangest gardens that I have ever come across is this one, which I was sent this photograph by a photographer after in the, I think 2002, which is a concrete garden a sort of mountain. I don't quite understand what it is, but it was the garden of Mullah Omar's um, house in Kandahar. And it's just, I mean, that it, 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 as a lawn or garden ornament, it's rather bizarre. I don't know. But, you know, you could hardly say that this is, is a, and this little palm tree down at the bottom, I don't think, it, can you all see? It, right in the middle, the man is st standing right next to a, right in the center, that thing that is a. Well, exactly, but you know, I mean. Triumph over the landscape? I don't, I mean, what to, do with a, what to do with excess concrete? I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I mean, it, it's just, anyway, it's bizarre. And then finally, um, what do we do about um, contempt, well, not finally, but what, what do we do about contemporary art? And, you know, look around the room. This is, um, um, or uh, here in, uh, on the screen, we have uh, Lala Asedi, who's a Moroccan artist um, who uh, wor works in the US. Um, and she does these extraordinary photographs, these enormous photographs um, that she uh, does here in Morocco. Um, and so this is one of her photographs from a series. Uh, uh, is that Islamic art? The, uh, in case, you, uh, are you familiar with her work at all? But you know, for those of you who aren't, that she uses henna to write uh, all over her subjects. And her, I mean, she spends a great deal of time sort of living and talking with her female subjects, all women, and, um, and then writes these endless, um, verses and on, in henna on them and on their clothing, and then photographs them. Yes? Oh, well, there is another one. Uh, it's really famous, where she mixes like, uh, the, the calligraphy, like Arabic calligraphy, with the body. And it's been said that it's a mixture, a combination of the profane, 
the body and the sacred, which is the right. Torah. Right. And that's why her, her, her work is really controversial. Right. Like she, she's breaking she's breaking the she she's breaking the taboo and mixing the two that are unmixable. Right. Yeah. So you know, is that it, it, so? That could possibly, one could call it Islamic art, even if it's somewhat, you know, questionable. Because she, let us, let us say, she's you've used writing tell with. Tell this to a Saudi. Yeah, if, as <laughs> Sheila says, tell this to a Saudi. You know, no, no. But and, and mixing women, and you know, I mean, it raises all sorts of questions. Or, what about the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha? the new Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, which is, was done by a Chinese-American architect for um, a Gulf potentate to house a collection of Islamic art, or whatever that is, from around the world. Is that a work of Islamic art? Modern. Modern. <laughs> most modern. And then we get to the perennial question of images of the prophet. And that, it, you know, we, um, uh, Professor Phila said at the beginning that, you know, this question of images has, uh, which I'm not going to particularly talk about, but, but I, one has to raise this, that there were, it is said that it was forbidden to um, depict the Prophet Muhammad. But here are two examples of great important works of Islamic art made by Muslims, for Muslims, that show pictures of the Prophet. One of them, the one on the right, showing the mirage, the miraculous night journey to heaven. On, on the left. I mean on the left, excuse me. And the one on the right, um, showing the uh, Muhammad um, placing the black stone when the, um, when the various people of Mecca uh, rebuilding the Kaaba could not agree on who should place the black stone back in the Kaaba. Um, he, he got them all to take the corners of a cloak. He took his cloak and took the corners of it and he placed the black stone in the cloak so that everybody could carry it together. The one on the left was done in the 16th century in Iran. The one on the right um, done in the 14th century in Iran, early 14th century. Clearly, it was OK in Iran in certain circumstances by certain people at certain times. So are we allowed to show this? this is, we're historians. Yes? Um, I just want to know. Um, Probably, I think these artists um, probably are like uh, anti-Islamists or like atheists who, who are revolting or rebelling against the, because it's really uh, not allowed to portray the prophet. So I think it's kind of a revolution or like going against or, or like resisting the tradition when they did this. It's not allowed today. It's not allowed, let's say, in Morocco. It's not allowed in certain places at certain times. But clearly in Iran, it was OK. It's not allowed. They just took your picture away. Yeah. Over but your head. Iran no is picture. more strict oh. when it comes to your picture on oh. your screen. No, not on your screen. Oh, uh, screen. yes. <laughs> you see, it's not yeah, allowed. It's, it's not allowed. <laughs> I mean, now this is, you know, I mean, this is a real problem. I mean, are we allowed to show what exists? Or do we say we're rewriting history? And I find that, I find that uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not doing this to offend anyone. And I certainly didn't put up these pictures. But I think you should all know that what we know, what we expect, just as Professor Philae said at the beginning, that what we think we know about the hatred of images and stuff like that is all interpretation. The Quran says nothing about images. The Quran says nothing about images of the prophet. It prohibits worship of images. But these are not like Christian images to be worshiped, like images of Christ or the Virgin Mary that people bow down to and stuff. These were from books of poetry and history. The one on the left was from a book of poetry. Poems. What? 
poet. Columns. Poetry. Columns. And, and you can all tell that it, you, you, even if you don't read Persian, you can all tell that it's poetry because it was, it's written in columns. And I have to say that thanks to Sheila, we always um, used to have our students who were undergraduates who had no knowledge of Arabic or Persian or any language and stuff like that. You would always tell them, how do you tell Arabic from Persian? And Arabic had lots more vertical, paired verticals from all the al, all this, all that and stuff. So they could look for two vertical lines over and over again, and that was an easy way. And then how do you tell prose from poetry? And prose, and I'm sorry I didn't put up the prose page, but it runs across the line where poetry is in, certainly per Persian poetry is always written in multiple columns. So what do we, you know, what do we do about this? What do we do, how do we deal with this? How do we say that this is, that this is, uh, this, this existed and that what we are told is not necessarily true. Professor? Yeah. Is it, okay, is it okay to ask a question? Yes, absolutely. I guess, uh, or, or more like an intervention, I guess when we are speaking about Iran as, 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 as this um, country, they, they, it's, we are talking about two, in Islam, we are t talking about two major doctrines. We have, we have the Sunni and the Shi'i. So, so maybe uh, for them, it's allowed to uh, but, paint um, the prophet. But for us as, as Sunnis, uh, it's, 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 it's forbidden. Right, okay, now that's, that's a good theory. But to test it out, you look at these two pictures and you have one of them, the one on the right, was done in, under the Mongols, uh, who were the Ilkhans who ruled Iran, who were, had converted to Sunni Islam and were Sunnis. And this is done for the ruler, this is done. And what he, he commissioned a book of history from the Grand Vizier, his Grand Vizier, and the book was multi-volume work. Sheila has written extensively about this. And it had the history of all the different peoples of the world, the Franks, the Chinese, the, including of the Muslims, of the Arabs. And, and this is a picture of important events. And there were other pictures of various events in the life of Muhammad. It's, they were Sunnis. Um, so, that doesn't necessarily follow. You know, it's a, it was a good theory, but it doesn't. Yes, it's, but one can also say that there is not a great tradition of book illustration of, of, of in North Africa, for example. There, what, there is one illustrated mm -hmm. ma um, literary manuscript that survives from um, Al-Andalus, which is now in the Vatican Library. Now, does anyone have any idea why there are so few illustrated books? I mean, they were popular in Turkey, they were popular in Iran, they were somewhat popular in Egypt, but they were certainly popular in India. So you have some Sunni countries, you have some Shia countries. Why, why, so uh, that doesn't seem to be, the, it doesn't seem to be related to the Sunni-Shia split. So why, why would be, there be so few from, let's say, um, Al-Andalus, from Spain? Any idea? Historically? Well, one problem was, Someone's oh yes, oh, yeah. Just a question, are these like illustrations official, like government official? Yes. I mean, they're both, these are both made for the highest levels of government, the princes. One, for the, the, the Sultan, the, 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 the Shah of Iran. This is not popular art. This is, this is really, um, uh, this is the, now, the question, you do raise an interesting question, which is how many people would have seen this? Because what, what are these? What kind of paintings are they? Are they paintings on walls? No. no. Where, what? Carpets. Not carpet. What are they, where are these paintings? You would, 
where, where were these found? What context are they in? Manuscript. They're in manuscripts. They're in books. So the only way you see them is when you open the book. Yes? So, so are you looking for this specific incident that's happened in the past in, 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 uh, uh, in Spain, uh, where uh, we are looking for this uh, burning of, of libraries? That's the one. Yes, exactly. That, that so much of what and so we, this brings up this very, very important point, which is so much of what we have has survived accidentally. And so there is this one manuscript of the love story of Bayad and Riyadh that is illustrated with paintings. Um, and it probably is from the 13th century and shows very, these two lovers, you know, it's the Romeo and Juliet story or something, the same kind of thing, very popular in all cultures. And uh, there are pictures of these two lovers in the garden, and he has to disguise himself, I think, as an old woman to go see her in, the, you know, in her garden and stuff. But there, that's the only one. Now, should we argue on the basis of that one manuscript that there were no other manuscripts? Or do we say, this is the only one that survived? And then do we have to say, what else might have survived? Now, I don't know of any illustrated manuscripts that survive from, that were produced in Morocco, or Tunisia, or Algeria, except for religious manuscripts like the Dalai Hirat. I do not know of any. Now, does that say more about the particular form of Islam, not, of, not necessarily Sunni Islam, but the particular, whether it's Maliki law as opposed to Shafi'i law, that, and these things have changed over time, that people interpret these things. So as scholars in the 21st century, we, I think we have to sort of like realize that these truths are not immutable. They change over time. And that we have to be um, open to seeing um, to, to seeing the variations, even though they might very well disagree with what we deeply believe personally. Um, so, enough with it. I, you see, I, I knew that when I showed these pictures, it would right. I was thinking of bringing. I have a slide of all the Danish cartoons, but I thought that that was not that was really going to be offensive. But, um, so, you know, this is the classical map, you know, that I often show of the world of Islam. You, uh, go back, back one more. Oh, did it not, did it, it disappear? It didn't show up. Oh, I don't know why, okay. No. No, okay. Well, I have a, a, a map, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know why. It's funny. Yeah. Um, and that, um, uh, that, as we know, it extends from, you know, the co west coast of Africa the, to China and stuff. And then, of course, if you go on one more, I, I mean, now we have um, uh, many, many Muslims in Europe. And I think the, the, color, uh, the color on this map is to show the percentage of Muslims in the society so that there are few, let's say, in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, few if any, whereas lots in um, Albania and um, uh, Serbia. Uh, we have buildings, anyone know where this is? Timbuktu, right. So you have, I mean, you know, a mosque in Timbuktu, and then as promised, China. Now, I'm really sorry, I should have put in a detail, because this, well, you see, what is guarding, guarding the entranceway on either side? This is the entrance to a shrine complex in China. Yeah, there are dragons on either side of the thing. Um, and there are, there's Chinese writing across the top. And then there's right underneath the ar uh, right underneath the central arch. There's Arabic writing. Is that a mosque? It's a mosque. Yeah, it was the entrance to a mosque. So it's hybrid 
Well, it's, they think they're Muslims. They think they're good Muslims, you know? Who are we to say that they're not good? I mean. Well, Islam is not particular, uh, particular to one region. So if you if he moves to another country, it has to absorb that culture. So I, I don't think there is anything wrong when mixing think, the culture, the local culture with the. Right. I think you just got yourself in trouble because <laughs> you, Islam Islam moved to Morocco, right? Yeah. And so we have to say that Islam in Morocco is a hybrid of Moroccan traditions. African traditions, continental Arab tradition. tradition, Amazigh tradition right. as well. Right, exactly, it is. And, every, and th you can say that about Al Andalus, about Spain, you can say it about Iran, you can say it about Arabia, in effect, that there are pre Islamic traditions. Yes? Just a little reminder, if I may, we would like to focus in these seminars on the heritage of Muslims, not on normative Islam. Because if you wanted to know what the Islamic norm, should you do this or should you not do it? Should you allow this or not and so on? That would take us into a theological discussion. We would not have scholars like Professor uh, Bloom or whatever. We would have rather some ulama or traditional right. who would tell us this is halal. And let me just also add a little small reminder for our colleague who remarked about Iran and Shiism that Iran was not Shi until the 16th century. Right. And they had to bring theology, Shi theologians from Arabia to teach the population Shiism. Yeah. And if I may say more or less, the main Sunni theologians are originated from Iran. So there was an ex a kind of exchange. The Sunnism was a gift from Iran to, to the Arab world, if I can say, while Shiism has been forced on Iranians by Arab theologians. So he had, I think we should keep some caution about the heritage of Absolutely. Muslims. The picture well, is so complex, I mean, so I, different from everything we may believe in. Thank you. I, I would just say that um, my early work was on, specialized on the Fatimid dynasty in Egypt, which was uh, in North Africa, and they were Shiite. But mm -hmm. the, the thing of it that Art historians always comment about on is how uh, you know how many pictures there are on ceramics of from the Fatimid period, not on anything else, but on ceramics. Now, does that have to? Do, they always say, "Oh, it's because they're related to Iranian Shiites." Well, they're not. You know, so it, 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 we should. I think. I think this. Well, let me go back and say that one of the things that I found really, really interesting when I was a student, uh, let me, I'll just finish, and then, was how the questions in this field seem not to be answered. They can be asked, but they're not answered. And that makes it interesting. Yes. OK, thank you so much for your, uh, your presentation. First, I, I would like just to go back to the listen to the title of what is the Islamic art. I've been to many places in Spain, for example, Habra, Sevilla, Cordoba. Right. There are a lot of things to see there. Okay, but for me, when you are speaking about, let's say, uh, let's say the historic or heritage or the Islamic heritage, you are speaking about something related to the Isla Islamic identity, okay? Or the Muslims who were ruling that place, okay? This is, this is my point of view. But my, my question here, if we, if we go back to, let's say, all these examples of Islamic heritage, okay? I'm, I'm not linking them to the Islamic faith, right. okay? <laughs> As you told me at the beginning, yeah. But uh, if, we, if we go back to all these examples, okay? Can we, can we say that, uh, that's, let's say, uh, the identity of Islam Okay, not as a religion, but of Muslims, still the same, although the place is ruled by, let's say, less Spanish government and so on. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I hate to to say um, whether we can whether we can judge. Oh, I, I hate to say whether we can judge about what all Muslims think. That one of the very current. Um, objections in um, uh, scholarship is the uh, is essentialism 
that to say all Muslims think this, that, that all, no, all Americans don't think the same thing, all Chinese don't think the same thing, all Russians don't think the same thing. Um, so I don't think we can say that all Muslims felt the same way about a particular kind of uh, art. Now, I want to move on to this question, this world, the, this world that we're talking about. And one possibility would be to say that we can't just study Islamic art, but we could then study the art of the Maghrib. And we can say that all Maghribis sort of had this one attitude. Does, would, you, would you agree with that? Do you think all Maghribis, you know, had the same attitude towards art? Or, so, I mean, that's, that's one possibility. And then, but if you're going to do that, and you're, and, you, you're, and you're saying we don't have such a thing as Islamic art, then you could say, okay, there's a, another kind of art that's focused on Egypt and Syria, that the art of the, the Mamluks in, the, in Egypt and Syria, that, that's another possibility. But does that have anything to, would that have anything much to do with the Islamic art of the Maghrib? Could you compare them? What about the world of the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire? What? No, okay, it's where, oh, yeah, right. So, you know, the Ottomans expanded into Europe. They expanded into Syria and Egypt. They expanded into Arabia and across North Africa to um, as far as Algeria, but fortunately not to Morocco. Um, and, you know, was there a cultural unity there? Well, if you look at Ottoman-era mosques in Tunisia, they certainly don't look like any Ottoman-era mosques in Istanbul. So you, can't, you can say there are certain shared culture, cultural values, but you, um, and the introduction of the Turkish language, but you can't find all, you, you can't say there's one, it's one cultural region. What about Arabia? We've been talking about Arabia, the heartland of Islam. Is there one, just one art, and that we should think about the art of Arabia? Uh, and similarly, Iran and the Iranian world, which stretches actually to include most of Iraq, Iran, and Central Asia. Or India, which includes Pakistan, Afghanistan, where it intersects with the Iranian world, um, and north, basically the northern two-thirds of the Indian subcontinent. Um, China and Central Asia, these are, all, these are all valid cultural regions. And then, of course, Southeast Asia, which is one that we, you know, I'm ashamed that I know so little about. That, I mean, when I was a student, when we were students, we only looked basically at the central Arab lands and Iran. And even, uh, even Morocco and North Africa was the exception. Uh, and I have to say that this is one of the reasons, I, I, I tried when I was first teaching to teach a course on North African architecture. And I realized I couldn't do it because there was nothing written in the language that the students could read. My students couldn't read French and so they couldn't study it. So there's the, this kind of regional problem. And then, of course, we've forgotten East Africa and West Africa. So if we have, you know, we could have, uh, in the article, we talk about these duchies, that instead of the, the empire of Islamic art, you could have the duchy of, you know, of the Maghrib and the duchy of the Ottoman Empire and stuff. So. But that, it seems to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And particularly, uh, when you look at, um, the, the map, the political map, what we realize is that the modern political boundaries, sometimes as in, um, uh, in uh, the Levant in Syria and Iraq, drawn by colonial powers after the First World War, that they don't make sense, or by um, 
treaties and such. So here in Central Asia, uh, Iran and Central Asia, that the cultural area that includes, um, uh, you know, northeastern Iran and Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, is often known in the um, in the sources as Transoxiana, the land beyond the Oxus River, although not of all of it is beyond the Oxus River, but it was a cultural region. Yet when you talk to Iranian scholars, they don't know what's going on in Turkmenistan or in Uzbekistan. And similarly, when you're talking to Uzbek scholars, they don't know about the contemporary work or the monuments of Iran. So the political boundaries are really quite different. And the same thing could be, we lost the oh, again. oh, we lost the slide. Yep, okay. okay. Here we are. Okay. So now we're moving on. Oops, now we don't seem to have that slide. No, go one, go one ahead. I no, back? No. No. I have it. It's not on this. I don't know. Oh. Okay. Well, okay, so I had to, there, somewhere or other, there's a, I had another picture, I don't know where it, I, I'll yeah. make sure, that, um, of Morocco and Algeria together. And that, you know, if you study only Moroccan art, you're not going to be, or Moroccan architecture, you're not going to be including Tlemcen in Algeria, which is as much a function, a, much a part of Morocco or the, the, the same as, as it was. And the political boundaries I was, or really only evolved around 1500 to divide these regions. And so it's, it's artificial not to consider them together. But modern politics, not to mention borders, makes it difficult for people to go and see for themselves what's on the other side of the fence. And so here, the, uh, this was a chart that we commissioned many years ago when we were writing a book, a sort of a handbook on Islamic art, to simplify the different dynasties that people were going to, the major dynasties that people were going to encounter in studying Islamic art. And the editor of this book said, we got to get rid of this chart. It's not clear. It's not helping. It's not helping. It just makes it more complicated than it was. And we're going to be dealing with just this region um, here with, um, did that? yes, it came. Um, you know, with this, and it's still pretty complicated. Yes. Do you all see how this is organized? Do you see, oh yeah, here. It's an organization. Yeah, you can see yeah. that it's geographical across the top. Yeah. And then, uh, right. They cut off the axes, yeah. Right, oh, they cut, the slide. No, no, the chart, did. they never showed. Oh, yes. And then here, down, uh, starting with the earliest period at the top and working down to the bottom. We're going to be dealing with, them. so these dynastic divisions don't make sense. Does it make sense to talk about um, I mean, these, uh, oh, ah, this thing, uh, why is it here? Um, is, we have the, geogra the geographical regions make sense that we looked at before, uh, only to a certain degree. Um, what about di uh, chronological ones? The dynasties, do, would it make sense to, to, to only talk about, let's say, the art of the Almohads? Would that make sense? Or the art of the Marinids? Any ideas? I mean, are there good reasons to do it? Are there bad reasons? Yeah. Thank you first for your presentation. I don't think so that uh, we can say that it's a Marin's uh, art and it's al Muahid's art and so on. Because each art is affected by, I mean, by previous arts. It's a process of accumulation. It's a, art is a, like a science. So it is produced and, and done through a process. It's, uh, I mean, it's benefited from the other, uh, I mean, expertise in art. And so it's not purely for example, and Muahid's art or Mirin's art and so on. 
It's, uh, right, it's a kind of a mixture of arts. And of course, uh, there is the, the impact of the Merint's uh, period, and that it's, uh, it makes it different, a little bit different from the previous arts. Right. I, I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, if you think of the marina, oh yes, please. I believe uh, we can talk about uh, Al Moravis or Al Mohadin's arts, since art is a kind of uh, an offspring or an artifact of a certain civilization. And since we talk about other products like philosophy, we talk about Yaqub Mansour's philosophy and his encouragement of the Ibn Rushd philosophy. I think w we can talk about certain eras and uh, dynasty art. I I agree with you, but I also disagree with you in the sense that I think uh, one of the things I realized when I was working was that history and theology are written by men who are literate. And what, they're, what you sometimes call in English the chattering classes. These are people, the people who wrote the books are the guys, the educated guys. Now, who were the people who made the art? And who were the people who wove the rugs, the people who hammered the brass to make the doors, who the calligraphers were probably, were certainly literate, but the painters, we don't know. And we know so little about these people because they weren't part of that class. I remember discovering when I was a student, I was working on I wanted to understand um, what women's piety was like in Egypt in the medieval period. And I realized that there was nothing written about it because the guys weren't interested. They only wrote about what men did. And then I discovered that there were 4,000 tombstones that had been collected in the museum in Cairo. And they had... Um, all the names of the deceased from the medieval period. And nearly half of the tombstones were for women. So what, is that t what did that tell me? I'm, you know, I, I, this was well known. I didn't, discover, I didn't discover this. They'd been published by um, Egyptian and French scholars over the, over the decades in the 1930s. But nobody ever commented that it was all these women. What does that tell you? What did, what did they tell me? That half the people who died were women? Yeah, what? Please. I believe that historical documentation is kind of similar to art in a way that it is subjective. So if, uh, as you've said before, it's not fair to just look at one part of history to understand the whole uh, of Islamic art. Uh, but I believe it makes you understand just one part of it. Uh, but I think the importance uh, or the important part is to um, identify which part and from which perspective are we looking to understand. Exactly, ex exactly. So that w you can say that the texts, the texts that were written by the, the historical texts, the, the reports of the dynasties and their great accomplishments and their wars and their battles tell us about what one segment of society did. But what does the art tell us? That which survives, not everything, but what does it tell us? Yeah. Please. So first of all, thank you so much for your informative presentation. Um, I want to discuss uh, this issue from an ideological perspective. So when we say an art is, an, is, an, is a representation, and representation is a discourse in itself, right? And when we say discourse, there is a kind of power, right? So we have to know those people who create that kind of art, do they have a kind of power? Because, um, because they, they carry a kind of ideologies, and that ideologies they carry a, 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 specific, a specific civilization at a specific time. So here, uh, there is a kind of uh, semiotic ambiguity, because when we say an image or a picture, we have to understand two things, as De Saussure said, the signifier and the signified. So the signifier is the sound, and the signified is the thoughts. So we have to uh, put much emphasis on that sound or that thoughts. 
So what does it mean? So the first thing, uh, oh, we should understand the, uh, the semiotic, uh, we should analyze those pictures from semiotic perspective. Uh, understanding the signifier, the signified, and we have sometimes we have a picture, and if, for example, if I give you a picture of a rose, you will not understand what does it mean. But if I, uh, I write, I use the language in it, you will understand. For example, you have a picture of a rose and you have um, the language happy birthday. You will understand that that picture uh, signified, it signified, it signifies the, the idea of the gift of birthday. So the same for the art. It's an image. At the very end, it's a discourse and it carries an ideology. And that ideology, it's, um, it is for a specific civiliz civilization at a specific time. I, I think you, you have a, a point for images. But a lot of what we're studying isn't a picture about anything. What, uh, yes? Oh, no, what, what is, I mean, that I, if I could go back, but I, it, I don't think it's worth, I, I don't think it's worth going. But just think of those images. How many, I showed you two pictures of, that had representation in them. But there is very little representation in the grand scheme of Islamic art. Representation plays a very small portion of it. I think in Western art history, and in art history in general, it is represent, representation is important. But how do you do a semiotic analysis of, of um, Zalij, or of this, the wood panels here? I do not understand that what, I, I was very interested, and I hope we'll have, be able to talk about this on Wednesday, about the Kutubiya Minbar. Because what I thought was, it, it reminded, it, you know, it, uh, as I'll show you, it was kept in a closet next to the mihrab in the mosque and pulled out once a week and then pushed back for the khutbah and then pushed back into the closet for the rest of it. And so it was brought out like a Chinese scroll that you came, it, you only appreciate it at a certain moment. But it wasn't a picture. It represented thousands and thousands of man hours of work. But it didn't represent anything except beauty. And I think what it did, and I'd like to imagine, that these things were meant to allow people to think, to invite people to, to contemplate. And we're all in, you know, modern, uh, modern, the modern world is all thinking that art has to be pictures, has to be about something, but it's, it doesn't. And there are many, and I, you know, from my own personal experience, I, I grew up in New York City and my parents used to take me to the Museum of Modern Art where I saw, you know, Picasso and Brock and Matisse and, and um, uh, and also clay and stuff. And all of the, that's the art that I knew that I grew up with. And then I went to university and I started studying art history. And I saw all these pictures of Christ and the Virgin Mary and stuff like this. And, you know, st Greek statues and stuff. And it was all strange. It was something that I had to learn. That I didn't grow up with representational art as the only way that it, and I think that we're, we've been, uh, we're, we've been co-opted in a way to think that there's something wrong with and, and lesser about this kind of, th this wonderful art that, like this carpet, for example, that doesn't represent anything except a love of beauty. So can't we say that the uh, art is a discourse? So because images and art, they share one thing, uh, which is they, they both carry a kind of discourse. So right, and when we say discourse, we should, uh, I mean, uh, we have to understand it from the perspective of uh, polysemia of meaning, different interpretations, etc. But the, abs Absolutely, but the problem is yes. how do we articulate this? What do, we, and there, you know, the problem is we don't have texts. We don't have, and so you can say that this means that and that means this. And there are people who do this, and they say that this, 
Zilij pattern means this and this one means that. But there are, this is what the individual artist might have thought or the craftsman has learned from his father who learned it from his father and maybe changed it a little bit along the way. But there, so what I'm saying is that these things are ambiguous and open to interpretation and that we are telling stories about these things. We're making, writing stories which probably tell us more about ourselves than they tell about the people that, or the times that we're studying. So, I mean, to Professor, put the Professor yes, oh yes. Yes? Please. Yes, thank you. I have just a small comment because I, I see myself, you know, involved in this very fruitful discussion about how to analyze the visual art or visual images. And I think that the uh, idea of adopting the semiotic analysis or the visual analysis is very important because uh, I think I, con I consider the pictures and images as part and parcel of the culture and the uh, semiotic analysis is, is uh, deemed to be important in uh, unraveling the orders of signification of pictures. You know, in semiotics, when we talk about semiotics, we have orders, first order of signification, second order of signification, and it is mostly used as a toolkit to, um, I would say, to um, uh, unravel and to uh, uh, reveal the, um, uh, I would say, the real uh, interpretations adopted by semioticians in general. And we refer back to the idea of um, archaeological, I think, theory, which is that you, mostly we adopt it to, to uh, understand the essence, the core essence of um, pictures, images uh, in, in general. Itself, this theory, you know, relies on the, as an intellectual framework, it relies too much on, uh, on the interpretation of the researcher. And this is, of course, very uh, uh, subjective, and it remains open to many uh, interpretations and understanding. This is what I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Microphone. Could you push your phone? Yes. I surveyed the articles that you uh, wrote and that you that have been sent to us. Uh, I think that. Um, Students, PhD students, should, by the end of this uh, uh, session and the workshops, they should become aware first of the definitional issues involved in Islamic arts. One. Two, they should understand and become aware that the, the <coughs> objective is not to come out with a clear-cut definition that this is Islamic, this is not. Huh? This is ours, this is not. There are no clear-cut lines and gaps between uh, the contributions of many people, many civilizations um, to enriching Islamic arts and Islamic civilization, and we have, Muslims everywhere, have contributed to strengthening, enriching the civilization of others. What we should be able to do by the end of the three days is that to understand the most important ingredients, components uh, of Islamic arts with the ultimate purpose to understand that diversity that is the, one of the strengths of Islamic arts. <coughs> that diversity that have been shaped by different variables, regional, religious, cultural, those related to dynasties, regions, 
different variables, different criteria that we have to understand for a better understanding. The ultimate purpose, once again, it should be, or at least for policymakers, since we are talking about policy making, is that how Islamic arts can better contribute to sustainable development in our country and, of course, other countries. How Islamic arts can contribute to sustaining peace, developing dialogue between cultures and religions, and maintain peace worldwide. And of course, as you know, that our country is a leading country in this respect, in Africa, in the north of Africa. To this end, I think we, we, we should work on, by the end, because we have to ask what is next, to set or at least to include this research area in our laboratories, in our master programs, particularly post-colonial master programs, post-cultural uh, studies, in history, because this area is multidisciplinary. It draws on different disciplines, and it requires uh, teams from different disciplines to, uh, to contribute to the improvement of our higher education, and of course, uh, in the direction of serving the goals of sustainable development. And this is very, uh, very, uh, very important. Uh, yes, this is just to set the ground of right. for, well, I thank you. The, the, the ground the, the, for the workshops. Right, yeah, well, I thank, thank you. you. I think that's, you have one more slide? yes, I have one more slide. Um, so the, the last, yes, so what, to sort of wrap this up, so is this, what is this? This is it a good term? I mean, I don't like it, and most of you don't like it either. I think. Um, but I'll just show you an example. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, they got uh, they uh, several years. They used to have galleries of Islamic art, but everybody complained. What is Islamic art? So they came up with a new title that they put over the the entrance to the galleries. And you can that go one more which is <clears throat> so every time you, someone asks you, what do you do for a living? You say, I studied the art of the Arab lands, Turkey, Iran, Central Asia, and South Asia. <laughs> Later South Asia, excuse me. No, I mean, it's terrible. I think there's one more. That's the Metropolitan Museum. I mean, I think it's bad. I think it's bad, but I don't know what the alternative, that there's any alternative. There, Marshall Hudson, who was the great American scholar, who was a Quaker and a deeply religious, um, socially involved guy, wrote a masterful three-volume history of Islamic societies. And in it, he came up with a, the whole first part of the first volume is all new definitions. And, and one of the words he came up with was Islamicate. And he argued that we should use Islamic to refer to the religion of Islam and Islamicate to refer to the, to the civilization associated with it. And that was proposed, uh, I guess, originally in the 1950s. And it still is not popular today. It just, it's, it's, it's very difficult for people, particularly non-Muslims, to understand the difference between Islam and Muslim. And you know, you find Americans saying, well, are there Islams in Morocco? But you know, they don't understand that the, the person who believes is different from the the thing that they believe in. So our experience, and this is frankly from an American perspective, is it's better to have this bad name and then explain it away than to try and come up with something else. And that in doing so, it encourages us to, um, to reach across regional um, boundaries and uh, temporal boundaries and come up with something that, uh, and, and yes, we can say that there, 
that there are ex cultural expressions in one place that are different from another one. But to say there are certain unifying features, and then as we've discussed endlessly, that there are certain features that are hybrids of local traditions, because all societies, there is no such thing as a uniform, absolutely uniform society. So I think we should leave it at there and um, open it to more discussion if we like. Well, again, thank you very much for these uh, clarifications. I would say I would call, uh, refer to them as clarifications. And thank you very much for giving the example of Marshall Hodgson, who is not very well known here in this part of the world, <clears throat> since his book, as you said, is quite uh, substantial. It has been translated recently into Arabic, but with a very bad title. They translated as it were the adventure. They mix between adventure and adventure. Oh, right. And let me say that in his, as you, I would come back to your to what you you pointed about his introduction. He insisted that, for example, when we talk about the traditions of Christians, we make clear a clear distinction between Christianity as a religion and Christendom as the era or the history of what these people right. did with their beliefs. And he suggested that we do the same for Islam, that we keep the